The Leadership Exchange podcast, a conversation with Christopher Piotroni, Professor of Leadership Practice and Director of the Birmingham Leadership Institute, and Paul Richardson, Entrepreneur. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leadership Exchange podcast with me, your host, Christopher Piotroni. The podcast is brought to you by the University of Birmingham, where I am Professor of Leadership Practice and Director of the Birmingham Leadership Institute. On this podcast, we ask whether we have the right kind of leadership for the challenges that we are facing, or whether we need to exchange our current approaches for something new. In today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Richardson. Paul has success in an extraordinarily diverse range of sectors from waste management to retail to fashion, e-commerce, cybersecurity, and most recently, uh, football. Um, Starting at 18 in his dad's skip hire business in the 1970s, uh, Paul's well known for being one of the key figures behind Gymshark, a multi-billion dollar global enterprise. And most recently, uh, Paul's behind the Gen Z fashion brands, Hera, and uh, more recently, a pre-loved uh, platform, Haru. So we're going to explore a wide range of themes with Paul today. And Paul, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. No, it's it, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, Paul, it's been fascinating reading about your career. And generally, when you're written about and, and when you're interviewed, you're, you're written up as this successful businessman, entrepreneur, which of course you are. You know, you've you've done an extraordinary amount of things. You've taken businesses, you've grown them, you've created jobs, you've made a lot of money. But when I look at your career, the thing that really stands out for me is that you seem to me to be somebody who is an innovator, a disruptor, and that that's really been behind a lot of your success. Is that how you see yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't really see that and didn't really understand the word disruptor until we got to Gymshark. And, you know, Gymshark was probably the the disruptor of of its time. But when I look back into waste management and look at what I did there back in the day, um, just as a for instance, um, in waste management sort of skip hire businesses back in the day, you only, in building sites, you only put skips on and everyone just threw everything into one skip. And um, we came up with an idea that Recycling needed to be sort of brought to the forefront and you know, building sites didn't do that. So we decided to talk to a company that's not here now, Tarmac, it was a very big Midlands company back in the day, had lots of sites building houses and buildings. And we talked to them and, and put on their sites uh, containers and skips for all of the different types of waste. So wood, cardboard, canteen waste, building rubble, etc., etc. So they had many different skips on site. Right. So when we suggested it and sort of people were like, they won't, they, won't, they won't do that, but they did because it saved them money. It was much better for their environmental policy and everything. So even, even in those days, I sort of look back now and I didn't realize it, but that was a disruption and, just and in itself. What, so, so that's really interesting because you say it in this really matter of fact way, it's kind of like, oh, we came up with this idea, and, but it came from somewhere, the, the impetus to think differently came from where did that come from you you have to think differently if you want to stay ahead i mean you're always i mean if you you know the thing if you're going to keep doing the same you're just going to get the same um so for me anytime i'm constantly thinking about new ways to do things and i love taking um sort of ideas from other sectors to to bring it into the sector you're in you know so looking at birmingham city football club at the moment um you know football's run as football and my belief we're looking at it most recently it's sort of a bit behind um, and as a for instance you know um, there's 20,000 people or 30,000 people go to the ground I'm very interested in what they have as an experience on that day on the Saturday but what about all the other days and what about the 50,000 the 1 million people that are outside that you can bring in somehow so you know I'm constantly looking now at, at things like that just at the football side of what can we bring in 
from the e-commerce that was working, what can we bring in from another sector, et cetera. So uh, you always have to look, you have to stay ahead, um, you know, and another thing I used to work seven days a week, which, you know, might be frowned upon today. Um, but the way I looked at it was when I had my skip hire companies way, way, way back, was that if I worked seven days, most of my competition were working five to five and a half. So by the time the end of the year came, I was 80 to 100 days ahead of them mm. before they even started. So that to me wasn't something that took a university degree to get or, you know, I had to do anything for it. It was just basically I was working harder. I was working more. So again, it's just things like that. But that's something else that strikes me about, about your success, Paul, is that you've quite often been sort of on the boundary of something, like not exactly on the outside, but not exactly on the inside either. So like no waste even. You weren't you were you were actually in another company and you were come you were giving a perspective into no ways. Jim Shark, you were sort of brought in, you weren't one of the founders. You just you mentioned earlier Birmingham City Football Club and you're thinking about that from the perspective of somebody who's been in other sectors. I mean, do, again, do you see yourself that way and, and, and how significant do you think that's been I, for you? I quite like helicopter view. Right. So again, with Steve Hewitt at, at Jim Shark, he sort of invented that for me because we were very fortunate. And I think that was one of the successes of Jim Sharp was able to have someone with that helicopter view, constantly looking at where people were going and saying, don't go down there, that's a dead end. Um, that is one of the things I do. I like to be high level. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult if you're not actually right in the depths of it to see in the depths of it, but you can see high level and, and work with the people who are in the deep end. I, I, I just wanted to explore this idea of, of adaptation a bit more, and, and in particular in relation to growing companies, because that's been a big feature of, of your career as well. And you know, you've you've worked with a number of companies, right, all the way back to the skip hire business, where where sometimes quite successful companies have then stratospherically successful. And obviously, Jim Shop's the one that that um, uh, you're probably best known for, and and, and people will will know the brand. I think when you first got involved with Jim Shark, it was already pretty successful, right? I mean, it was a bit, it was a bit, you're not exactly a mum and pop store, but it was a, a, a little fly by the seat of your pants, but it was doing okay. Yeah, yeah, it was about four and a half million, uh, around about eight people in, in the business. So it was run a little bit. I mean, you know, um, Ben and Lewis ran it almost like a bit of a laugh. You know, it was a bit of a joke. It was great fun for them. Young guys, sort of um, 19, 20, earning money, you know, um, driving a couple of nice cars. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, by comparison to a lot of businesses and, you know, businesses that I developed in my day, you know, really, really hard work, it had come quite easy, you know, but they were onto something really good at that time. You know, they'd hit on something very innovative with the way how they developed it. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was early doors, but it, it lacked, it lacked structure in any way, shape or form. So the thing is, and again, this is a Steve Hewitt, um, analogy you know it's like they've got a house and they wanted to put an extension on another extension of the extension but the foundations were all on sand yeah so you know the house itself is going to start to wobble never mind you put an extension and an extension on it's going to literally collapse and that's what they hadn't got so that was one of my almost my specialities is 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 seeing that the foundations need to be put in as much as possible and as much as you can afford because you can't do that sometimes in the way that um, you know maybe we did at Gymshark because it was very successful and very cash rich at the time so we could easily go we need to do this we need to do that we need to do that sometimes you can't afford to do that but I think having in your head as a, as a you know uh, as a business person that you want to do that you know it's the right thing so for argument's sake, rather than when you get your first load of money and go and you're buying yourself a Lamborghini, put that money into the foundations of your company and then that will help it grow. And, I, I, you know, just to give people a, a, a sense of the, the growth trajectory here, so it goes from about four million in, a, in when did you first get involved? It was four and a half million at the end of 13. And then becomes famously a unicorn, yeah. over a billion dollars. Yeah, by... I mean, current turnover is going to be ballpark in 500 million. Okay. Yeah, roughly speaking, okay. in 10 years. Right. So phenomenal yeah. growth. Yeah. So many organizations really struggle with that sort of growth, yeah. you know, particularly when there's a, a, a founder 
or two founders in this case involved um, and uh, I guess a pretty small staff when they they began probably people they knew yeah, it was friends and relatives right yeah. exactly so so the the growth is wonderful but it's also going to change everybody's life in lots of ways their yeah. working life the way that they imagine what this company is what their job is uh, you know all sorts of new people are going to come in people they didn't know you know a whole loads of change how how do you you know having been through that what do you see as the kind of leadership challenges of taking people through that journey so it's several um, again when ben and lewis i sat them in my office it was actually no waste office at the time right. because i was still with no waste you know there's a transition period where i was helping them and I, and I asked them what they wanted to do with the company because they, again you know they were mini successful what they did and i said you know what do you want to do with the business you know you've got a, a nice lifestyle business here which, which you know isn't is fine, and they said no, no, no. We want to be as big as Under Armour. I said okay. That means there's lots and lots of change that you've got to go through, and there's going to be some of it you don't like, for absolute certain some of it you don't like, and you're going to need to adapt and grow with that change. And there's there's several things. Um, you know, people. One of them. Business is about people. Um, you're going to need to hire people much better than you. And that is given at their particular sector or section or whatever they do, or their you know their talent has been much better than you, and that can be quite hard for people. So I know Lewis he struggled with that at the time, um, and eventually left the business. Um, whereas Ben realised that that was the way growth went, and you know that's one of the main ingredients for growth is is people, putting the right people in the right place, and. Um, yeah, that for me is the hardest thing that anyone has to do. Yeah, I, I, this thing about risk is really interesting, isn't it? I mean, you're an entrepreneur, right? That's all about it's risk. It, it's all about risk taking. Yeah. So, do, I mean, do you see yourself as a risk taker? Oh, right? yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And do you, and, and do you enjoy? It? I mean, is that the experience? Or oh, yeah. It? I mean, it's 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 part of it. It's 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 the high of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's when you get it right. But as long as you get more right than wrong, you know, you can't get them all right. But I enjoy. Um, Doing things that other people wouldn't do, um, trying to be ahead of the curve as much as you possibly can. I'm probably not the very, very first mover. I'm probably just a little bit behind that. I'd love to be that first mover sometimes and just, you know, see something completely no one's ever seen. But you know, I'm, I'm just probably a little bit behind that. Is why I look at it. It does come across as you speak, people that that there is a sort of you know a values base, right? There's something that motivates you about you know I don't know what it is being decent to people or being you know, good human being. There's something that that sort of infuses the way that you try to exercise your leadership. I think it it pays in the long term. Look, it doesn't always work. You know, in business, you're in business, and you know things happen within the business that sometimes don't go quite right or whatever. But I always look long term if I possibly can. So I look in businesses for not a supplier, but someone in. A, it's almost like a relationship because there's a time and I not I might need them to get me out out of a you know a hole. Can you get me that material quicker? And if you're, I'll say nice to them, if you're respectful to them, you don't have to be their friend. You know, they're not your friend, it's business. Um, but respect there might get you that quicker so that to help you out when you've got a problem. And then, then sometimes when they can't deliver to you, you know, you don't rip their heads off. You know, it's a case of saying, okay, I've got to understand what they're going through. Is it logical? Is it okay? Or are they taking the mickey? Yeah. You know? Um, being firm and fair. I think I think it works. It works long term because you go up, you come down, you go up, you come down. My my life has been it's been like this, you know, it's not just one nice easy line. I, I think that this holding us holding a, a kind of attitude of curiosity is a really important part of leadership and I think we really struggle with it. And I think one of the reasons is because it, it's exhausting. Yeah, right? it's hard work. Yeah. People don't like hard work really, do they? They when everything needs to come easier and I always say to people, people talk to me about balance of work and life and things like that. And I don't know any successful person that I've ever met, whether that's an Olympian, a footballer, a business person, a leader of some description in, you know, government or whatever. It doesn't matter what you, who hasn't had to work really, really hard. It's very, very, well, I don't know any. So hard work comes into it all the time. And I think if you wire yourself for hard work and expect it, then it's not a surprise. Oh my God, this is hard. No, actually, I was expecting it. You know, it's going to be hard. You know, you're just going to run a marathon 
say, you're not thinking, oh, that's going to be easy. It's going to be hard, even if you're the best and the world record holder. It's going to be hard, some description. Different level of difficulty, probably, than if I ran it or tried to run it. Um, but I think if you expect it and are ready for hard work, you know, I lift. I'm, I'm a lift at the gym. And, you know, if I've got a couple of hundred kilos on the floor to do a deadlift, I know it's not going to be as easy as lifting a hundred. So I've got to set everything ready, get my mind ready, get my body ready to take that 200 off the floor. Mm. But if I walk up to it thinking it's going to be just dead easy, I'm, it's not going to come off the floor. Yeah. And it's going to feel really hard. But if I prepare myself, get myself in the right headspace, get the right form, execute it, it will feel easier. And that getting yourself in the right headspace, the and that sort of preparation that you, you do in the moment when you're lifting is also seems to me connected to what I know is another interest of yours, which is around supporting mental health and mental oh, well being. Because the because, you know, the the work that you've done, you know, the the highs, the lows, the risks that you've had to hold, risks that have gone wrong, as well as the ones that, you know, have gone well, the success can be as hard as the failure sometimes. So so staying mentally well through that kind of process must have been a demanding for you in the way that it is for everybody in organizations yeah again i think it's getting ready for it and expecting it so if you're going to put yourself under pressure you're going to have times when you won't feel as good about yourself for whatever reason that could be physically and mentally um, so for me, in terms of my regime in now, in terms of fitness and vitamins, I'm in, in my bag down there, there'll be all my vitamins for the day and things like that. I drink a lot of water and stuff like that. Okay, stuff I've learned over time that I probably didn't do when I was younger, but you can get away with it when you're younger. Um, preparing yourself ready for that. Same mentally, you know, um, I think you cannot be successful or want to be successful without having some form of issues at some point. So again, open yourself up. So I'm a massive advocate for counseling, you know, people to talk to who have no agenda with you. They're not your mate who's just gonna agree with you, but will challenge you about yourself and why you think the way you do or where you're feeling, etc. So for me is making sure that you're open to it and not waiting for it to or go completely wrong, um, preparing yourself mentally and, and physically, I think is really important. And do you, I mean, do you see this support for sort of mental health and, and well-being as being sort of, you know, part of a good business? Should, should 100%. It... Yeah, I mean, again, um, at Gymshark, I bought in something there, which they now use, as, it's called Deload now. So we brought in loads of experts um, around, we was a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and dietitians, because again, dietary stuff is huge in the sort of gym industry and around there. You know, that's uh, the eating disorders, but the, again, disordered eating is equally as bad. Um, we had a GP and had all those sort of people around. So I, I will carry that through now to every company that I deal with in terms of trying to make sure that you have, you know, healthcare and, and help wherever they need it and push them forward and make sure that people are being spoken to and their mental health is being considered at all times. Um, but also giving them the expectation that if we are going to be a successful company and we are going to be pushing the boundaries, we're also going to be pushing those boundaries a little bit. So that we have to get ready for it. Be prepared, I think is, mm. you know, one Do of the things, you know, if you're going into it completely blind and blase, then different, but if you're ready for it, you can prepare yourself for it. Do, do you find still that, you know, you, you'll find you get resistance, people saying, well, you know, it's going to come off the bottom line and, and we're, we're, we're not, we're not a mental health organisation. No, we're, I think, we're I think people are getting better. I think they go, what I'm not keen on is the token gesture thing. I think there was an advert at one point, it might have been, I won't say the company doesn't matter, but sticking the post-it notes on their head and stuff like that. I think campaigns, my mind are a little bit, you know, for me, it's not about just doing a campaign. I know it can heighten awareness, but for me, it's about what you do on a constant heartbeat basis all the time. It's not just what you do when someone's either ill 
and then you sort it out is you just keep doing it on a constant heartbeat basis give people the the outs for me company counselors having someone that you can send your people to they don't have to think about it they don't have to think about paying for it they go straight to that person it's completely private but you you know you've got that person they can refer to as a counselor I'd have that everywhere I go if I could. It, it seems to be another theme for you, Paul, is that you 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 never want to say um, it's a, a trade off between the bottom line and doing the right thing. You know, it's when you can align those two yeah. things that real change happens. Is 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 yeah, that right? people people are not stupid. They 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 work out when companies are doing things for the sake of it. So they work out when you know. Um, a diversity type scenario is being almost like crafted. Your consumer will work that out. Your staff will work that out. When you're doing something with a true heart, so, you know, um, at Hera, for instance, um, you know, we have a, a quite a large gay community in our customer base. And I was just interested and I was I asked some people that I know, okay, what do we do to help this out without it being sort of crafted? And it, you know, they gave me the answers. You know, it was you support something constantly. You know, you don't just go in on Pride and do something on a big splash and put it all over your website and then you disappear again. You constantly support things. And I think it's the same with mental health. It's a constant heartbeat of things rather than just an advertising brand awareness campaign. You know, for me is, you know, you're doing something. You can't have every type of different person in your, you know, roster. You know, that's just crafted. Oh, we've got to have that type of person and that type of person. That type. That's not actually real. That's just putting it out there. You know, people in your business should be diverse. People you associate with should be diverse in all the different ways. Uh, but also they have to be the right person for the job or the contract or whatever you've got to do. Because that comes first as well. Because mm-hmm. that's the commercial trade-off. You know, in my head, you know, it has to work for both. When you're when you're pushing these boundaries, when you're when you're or at times in your career when you have been, when you've been making the case for for you know mental health support, or you've been making the case to support you know people who might you know be customers of yours, but in that case you know like like you know people from LGBTQ um, identities and so on, are you aware that that that's leadership? That that you know because without you that might not happen. And for me that looks like leadership. Yeah. I, I... I think so, but it just comes natural to me. I just see it as logic. I just see it as the way it should be. It's the right thing to do. You know, and to my mind is I don't want to spend a load of money on a campaign and it just then fall flat. I'd rather have something that works over time and gives you the things you want and gains you the respect from everyone. Um, because for me, supporting people is not about giving sweets out to them type of scenario. It's the right, you know, giving them perks and discounts and other of things and support them when they need it. And that's what's important. Put the money in the right place at the right time. Um, but it is it is difficult sometimes to get people to see it. And the trouble with some big companies is you give them something, they don't do it, and then they'll do it when that's their idea type of scenario when it suits them rather than actually getting ahead of the curve. You know, for my mind, to get ahead of that curve, that's when you really, really get it. So, Paul, uh, one question that we ask all of our guests, um, whose leadership inspires you and, and why? Uh, um, many, many people inspire me, but probably a combination of two. I um, probably mentioned them earlier. Um, Alex Ferguson. Um, I just think him dealing with the stars of Man United and all the people around him at that time to um, the level of protection he gave them. But then when you hear about the, the hairdryer scenario in the dressing room and throwing the um, the football boot at Beckham, you know, that type of thing. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, by the way, but um, just that sort of style of leadership in terms of protecting, but also holding to account behind closed doors um, is one. If you could combine that with Steve Hewitt, um, you know, uh, Jim Shark, uh, I have an immense uh, admiration for him and what he's taught me uh, from the culture, um, understanding, and um, just the sheer sort of um, empathy 
an ability to communicate with um, vast numbers of people. Um, I can't actually do that in the same way that Steve does, but I really love that sort of style and it's a level of honesty that Steve has brought, had brought to Gymshark at the time. I've really taken so much on board. Um, and uh, so those two to me are a bit of a combination. So that's where we'll be. Paul, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us on the Leadership Exchange podcast today. It's been uh, absolutely fascinating exploring both that kind of, you know, really focused business entrepreneurial kind of notion about how do we actually, you know, deliver things that people want and stay in the real world. But with that, this ability that you seem to have developed to, to be open to learning, to kind of stay curious, to stay open to what the future might be and what people from a different generation might have to contribute and and ultimately to combine that in ways which create you know fantastic uh, brands that people really want to buy do do extraordinary things in the world um and and i guess you know as a as a chelsea fan um i i, I wish you well with birmingham uh, city football club because um you're you're probably right this may be your your biggest leadership challenge uh, to date. But thanks again for being with us, Paul. No, it's been thank, an thanks very much. pleasure. At least you're blue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to those of you listening, thank you for joining us again. And uh, we look forward to you joining us again next time. Uh, all the details of everything we've talked about today with Paul will, as always, be available in the show notes. Um, and if you've enjoyed this episode, do please subscribe on whatever channel you're using and give us a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you've got any suggestions for guests or for topics, do let us know those as well. We always look at them and we're really keen to have the people who you'd like to hear from on this podcast. Otherwise, uh, look, um, stay up to date with Leadership Exchange, what we've got upcoming. And again, you'll find the details and the links in the show notes. The University of Birmingham and Birmingham Leadership Institute logo. Tune in to the Leadership Exchange podcast, birmingham.ac.uk forward slash leadership dash exchanged. Produced by Creative Media.